So today we are continuing our short little series called Money Talks. Jesus had a lot of conversations about money in the scriptures, and in this short little two-week series, uh, we are highlighting just two of those conversations that Jesus had about money, about treasure, about the stuff we tend to cling to, but God wants us to let go of. And I know that if you're here as a guest, you're thinking, man, I came on the Sunday where they're talking about money. <laughs> Don't worry, we're going to talk about Christmas starting next week, so come back. Or you're thinking, this is the week I brought a friend? Man, couldn't they give us a heads up? We did. We started this conversation last week. Maybe you just weren't here. Uh, but I know that when the church talks about money, immediately there are a lot of folks who, who start to kind of have a turn in their stomach or they get a little skeptical about the church when it talks about money or you have a little baggage when it comes to preachers talking about money or asking for money. I get it. The church as a whole and preachers in particular don't have the best of reputations on this topic. Uh, the story is told of a barber in a small town. And one day he opens up his shop and in walks the local sheriff and the barber is feeling incredibly generous. And so he says to the sheriff, I'm so thankful for how you keep our community safe. Today's haircut is on me. So he gives the sheriff a free haircut. Next morning, barber comes to the shop and there's a dozen donuts waiting for him. In walks the local florist. Barber is still feeling generous. He says, thank you for all that you do to keep our community beautiful. You go around planting flowers, and this community is beautiful because of you. Today's haircut is on me. Next morning, Barber goes to the shop. There's a dozen roses waiting for him. Barber still feeling generous. In walks the local preacher. And he says, local preacher, thank you for all that you do to provide for the spiritual care of this community. Today's haircut is on me. Wow. Next morning, goes to his shop. There are a dozen preachers waiting for him. <laughs> I realize that the church and pastors and preachers have a certain reputation when it com comes to money, but I'm just going to ask that whatever your preconceived notion is, that you just take that and you set it aside for the next 20 minutes or so. But what I really have for you today is a very simple question. Why aren't I more generous? Why aren't I more generous? Specifically, why aren't I more generous with my money? Why aren't I more generous with my money to the things that God has told me that he is really passionate about? Specifically, his local church, where, where believers bring in the first and best of what they have and they give it back to God for his work in this world, and also the love and care of my neighbors, which God said is what life is ultimately all about, being generous and, and loving to the people around me. Why aren't I more generous to those things? What do I give to those things? And what stops me from giving more to those two things? That's the question. Now, it's a question that is stirred up for us by this poor widow woman that Jesus meets when he's at the temple. So, so Jesus is at the temple nearing the Passover, which, in case you don't know, was a very, very big deal in first century Jerusalem. Hundreds of thousands of people would come from their hometowns into Jerusalem to be near the temple during Passover. And one of the first things that many of them would do is they'd go to the temple and they'd go to this little area where people gave their offering and they would drop in their offering into one of the designated boxes. They had the ability to kind of designate a gift and where they wanted it to go in the life of the church. And so people would walk in and they'd drop their gift in one of these boxes. And we're left with the impression that certain people made a big deal out of giving their gifts. In this context, it was, it was the wealthiest of people and, and the most well-known of people who made a big deal about coming in and dropping in their offering. And for whatever reason, Jesus has decided to do some people watching in this particular part of the temple. And Mark says that he sets up shop right there. He just sits down and he watches people bring their offering. And he watches some of the rich people roll in with their Tesla Cybertruck and their $600 sneakers and go, look how generous I am and drop a whole bunch of Bitcoin into the barrel. But that doesn't impress Jesus. It impressed a whole lot of other people, but it didn't impress Jesus. Now, it's not to say that Jesus can't be impressed by other people's generosity. Jesus is bowled over by one person's generosity, and it's not who you would think. It's, it's this poor widow woman who walks in, and she gives less than one quarter of one cent. But it just so happened to be all that she had. And Jesus is floored by her generosity. This is how Mark puts it. 
Mark, capturing the words of Jesus, says, Truly I say to you, the poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the offering box. For they contributed out of their abundance, but she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had, all that she had to live on. So Jesus pulls his disciples together, and he's like, guess who's most, most generous? Is it the rich guy who gave lots of riches but was still rich? Or is it the poor widow who gave virtually nothing but it was all that she had? And of course, the answer is really obvious. The, the most generous person is the poor widow. Now, now, the point of this particular reading is not that, that you should seek to live poor and that you should give everything you have until you have absolutely nothing left and you're eating rice and beans, if that at all. That's not the point here. The point is this. We're getting a glimpse into Jesus' heart and Jesus' mind about how he calculates and perceives generosity. Jesus does not calculate generosity the same way we do. Jesus does not measure generosity by the amount of money that goes out. Jesus measures generosity by what's left in the hands of the giver. Jesus does not measure generosity by what goes out. He, he measures it by what's left. You and I look at what somebody might drop in the bucket. But Jesus is telling us that's not an accurate measure. Because you know, depending on somebody's circumstances, they could give a ton in the eyes of the world, but have it cost them nothing. You see, for Jesus, generosity always involves trust and sacrifice. It's the kind of gift that's going to require a lot of reflection. It's the kind of gift that's going to alter your living through your giving just a little bit. And if, you, if your gift doesn't involve any trust, any kind of tangible sacrifice that you feel, is it really generosity? That's the question Jesus is trying to get us to ask. So now, knowing how Jesus calculates generosity, we have to change my initial question. My initial question was this, why aren't I more generous? But now knowing how Jesus calculates generosity, not by what you give, but by what it costs you and what you have left, the real question would be this. Why aren't I willing to live on less in order to give more? Why is it so hard for me to live on less in order to give more? To give in such a way that it actually affects my own living through my giving. Why is that so hard? And now that's a question that causes us to really think deep and really reflect. And that's really where Jesus wants us. Re reading about the the poor widow who gives the quarter of the cent that's all that she has to live on. It made me think about a man named Charles Feeney. In, in January of 1997, a mystery was solved that had boggled minds for about a decade. Someone was randomly giving people millions upon millions upon millions of dollars, and nobody knew where it was coming from. Money would roll into universities and to social service organizations seemingly out of nowhere. No one knew who to thank. No one knew how to ask for more. Uh, the, the money would show up as kind of an anonymous check with a note attached that said the giver does not want to be named. Well, eventually, the world discovered that it was Charles Feeney. Charles Feeney was an extremely successful businessman. And the reason he was discovered is because Fortune magazine was trying to put together a list of its 400 wealthiest people in America. And they put Charles Feeney on the list, but when they went to double-check their math, they discovered that Feeney was worth only 1% of what they assumed he should be worth. 1% of what the books said he should be worth. And the reason is because he'd given everything away. Feeney is still alive. He lives in a two-bedroom apartment that he rents in San Francisco. He owns no car, has very little assets. He has about $2 million in cash that he considers a nest egg, which is a nice nest egg, but to date he's given away over eight billion dollars. The richest one percent in our country give away on average about two percent of their income annually, yet Charles Feeney gave away 99 percent of his income for years without anybody ever knowing. He doesn't really talk about why he does this. He rarely gives interviews, but one can assume he just sees the world and he sees possessions differently than most people do. That's generosity. Now, now, why would someone want to grow in this kind of generosity? 
I mean, it's one thing to give. It's another to give till it really affects you, like tangibly. Why would someone want to grow in that and get better at that? And I've got three quick reasons for you, each of which could be a standalone sermon. We don't have that kind of time. I'll make this brief. The first reason that followers of Jesus grow in this kind of giving, and if you're here not as a follower of Jesus, good news for you, you're totally exempt from all of this. You don't have to. So like, go to the Galleria, have fun. But this applies to us who are followers of Jesus. The first reason we, we, we grow in this is quite clearly and very simply because God commands it. First and foremost, it's really a matter of obedience for us. All of God's words about giving are, are commands. They're, they're expectations. Here's what you will do. Here's the, the kind of generous person, sacrificial person you will be because you belong to me. For example, these are some words of Paul in the New Testament in the book of 1 Timothy. Paul says this, to Timothy to tell to his church. So this is advice a pastor is giving to one pastor about a sermon like this. He says, In your sermon, as for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be proud, haughty, not to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who richly provides us with everything. Don't hope in the stuff that you have, you who have a lot and you all have a lot. They are to do good. If they're to be rich in anything, tell them to be rich in being a good person, to be generous with their stuff and ready to share. This is not ready to share. This is ready to share. Be that kind of person. Have that kind of posture. We give first and foremost because God commands us to and because we love him and we believe he wants good things for us. That's why. Second, we, we seek to grow in this kind of extravagant giving because we believe that it will grow us. And not that it will grow our bank account. You can go to another church um, in another part of the city if you believe that's true. But we believe that, that giving like this in a way that Jesus measures generosity will grow our character and it will stretch and mature our faith. Over and over in the scriptures, God makes this promise that if you give in a way that floors Jesus, you will grow. You can't help but grow because it involves trust, it involves sacrifice, it involves all these really, really difficult things. So for example, just one verse among many, Proverbs 11, a generous soul will prosper and he who refreshes others through their generosity will also be refreshed. Most of us know someone whose faith and whose character we envy. Someone who, no matter our age, we say, man, I want to believe like them and be like them when I grow up. Do you know somebody like that? Whose faith and character you envy? Well, here's the thing about those kind of people. People who have a faith and a character that you envy have endured things in your life that most of us try to avoid. They have gone through things like loss and suffering and struggle and sacrifice. And that's how faith is grown and character is formed. We do this because we believe, though it's difficult, God will grow us in it. Third reason, we do this because the local church needs it. And the local church is the hope of the world. The local church is the hope of the world. God has chosen to do his miraculous and necessary work in this world through local churches like ours. He said, I have no body on earth but the body of believers here at St. Mark and in every other Christian church. And so it's through us banding together and pooling together the things that we have that we make the power and the presence of God known in this world in us and through us to our neighbors. It's through us. He makes all of it known through us, his people. And you might think that that's crazy, that that's how God has chosen to work, but that is how God has chosen to work. The local church is the great hope in a dark world. Not just because we have the gospel, as if that wasn't enough, but because no one in this world has, has healed more sick, loved more poor, transformed more imprisoned, founded more hospitals, started more schools, married more young, buried more old and dead, 
no one has done more good in this world than the local church. No one. It's not even close. And we are far from done. The local church is the hope of the world. That's why we give. Because God commands it. We will grow from it. And the local church, which is a bright light in a bad world, needs it. Because God does his amazing work, unmatched work, through it. And now the question that stirs for you and me is, how? How, how do we grow in this if we really want to grow in it? But, well, first let me go here. What are you feeling right about now? As you wrestle with the question of, of why don't I give more or why is it so hard for me to alter my living in order to increase my giving, as you wrestle with that question, are, are you discovering any answers? Maybe it's fear. You're afraid of going without. Or, or, or maybe it's, it's just comfort, like you like life the way it is and you don't want to change it. I get that. That's what it often is for me. Or maybe it's just ignorance, like you've you're not dumb. You've just never really wrestled with this question before. You've never really wrestled with the question of what does it look like to embrace biblical generosity? What is it for you? Whatever, whatever reason you discover for why this is difficult for you, like it's difficult for me, I do know how we begin to grow in this. First, we begin to grow in this by growing in grace. And what I mean is that we grow in our appreciation for just how extravagant God has been and always is to us. We, we grow in our appreciation of the fact that every little thing that we enjoy, beginning with the breath in our lungs, comes from Him. We grow in our appreciation of the fact that, that every single thing is forgiven. All the time, every day, every hour through the work of Jesus Christ. And we grow in our appreciation of that by relentlessly confessing our sins and our struggles to him and then hearing him meet every confession with absolution. I love you. I forgive you. I love you. I forgive you without end. We grow in grace by developing a habit of saying thank you. Every little thing that we encounter that we know we don't deserve, we develop a habit of looking up and saying thank you. And I mean the little things like short line at Starbucks, thank you. Kids who come, from, come home from school in a good mood, thank you. Coworker who helps you out before you head out on Thanksgiving break, thank you. Show me a follower of Jesus who is not generous with what he has, and I will show you a follower of Jesus who does not appreciate all that God has given. Generosity flows from gratitude. What do you need to be doing to be giving more gratitude? Grow in the grace of just how blessed you are. Let it flow through you. The second thing we do is we train our hearts. If you want to be a more generous person in the way that Jesus measures generosity, start to act like a more generous person. If you want to feel more generous, start to act generous in small ways. Now, I'm not saying that you should walk around faking it. God loves a cheerful giver, not a phony giver. But here's what I know, that, that our hearts follow our hands. What we feel in our hearts, what we believe in our minds, is, is most significantly shaped by the habits of our hands, by what we do. So if you want to feel and be more generous, start acting as if you're that generous person now in small ways and let your heart follow after you. Your, your desire will grow where your dollars flow. Your delight will increase where your dollars are aimed. And that's not a truth that comes from me. It's not something I made up. Jesus says that. Where your treasure is, there is your heart. And you see this all the time, like with your children. So for example, one day your kids go to college and you're paying for college tuition. And, and you didn't go to A&M, but your dollars and your daughters all go to A&M. All your treasure goes there. And what happens? Before long, even though you didn't go to that school, you're wearing some cheesy maroon t-shirt that says, I'm a proud Aggie dad. And then you're cheering for whatever it is they call football on Saturday afternoons. 
And even though you didn't go there, suddenly your heart is there. Why? Because your treasure, your dollars and your daughters are all there. That's how this works. We train our heart. If you want to be a generous person, start doing what generous people do little by little and watch what happens. We train our hearts. And the third thing is, we start today. The words that God gives to us in his, in his, in his, in his scripture about giving, they are, they are always present tense commands. God never says, hey, sometime in the future when it works for you, start thinking about what it would be, what it would look like for you to be more generous. No, read through the scriptures, just, just look at what God says about money, about generosity. He says things like this, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse today. Decide today in your heart what you will give. That's what he says in the New Testament. When the needs of your neighbor are made apparent, meet the needs of your neighbor. When it emerges, you respond. If you wait until you're willing, you will wait forever. If you wait until you're ready, guess what? Conveniently, you'll never quite be ready. So we start today. And, and, and friends here at St. Mark, if you call this place your church home, that's my ask of you is that you would start today wrestling with this question. Why aren't I more generous? But why is it so hard for me to live on a little less in order to give a little more? But my ask of you is to take that question home and have a conversation about it as a family, as a couple, or just wrestle with it, pray over it in your own heart, in your own mind. What do I give? And what stops me from doing more? For some of you, the answer to that question will be beginning the habit of what Christians call a tithe, where we bring a portion of what God has given to us, a, a set percentage of what God has given to us, back to God's house for his work, for, for, his, for his usage in his kingdom, for, for the things he wants to do in the local church. And we give it cheerfully, we give it regularly, we, we don't give here and there, we don't give whenever the spirit moves or our guilt gets too high, we, we decide in our hearts what we will give and we give it regularly, sacrificially, and we give it cheerfully. Figure that out and then ask this question, what more can I do? For my neighbor, for my friend, for my church. And then you'll be asking the questions that poor widows who give quarter of pennies, but it's all that they have, you'll be asking questions that they ask. And you'll be in the, the level of generosity that Jesus gets floored by. I, I, am, I am always amazed at the number of people who've grown up in the church who have never had a significant conversation around the deep biblical value of generosity. They've never wrestled with it. And that has to end. There are, there are far too many people in the church as a whole, but even in our church, who, who depend on the others. Well, others tithe. Others give. Others serve. Let me let you in on a secret. There are no other people. There's just us. Just you and me and the people who sit next to you. That, that's all there is. We, we are the people of God. We're the, we're the body of believers. It's, it's just us. If it's not us, it's not anybody. So it's got to be you. It's got to be you. It reminds me of, of the great preacher Charles Spurgeon. Uh, the story is told of, of, a, of a small church that had a big debt and they wanted to pay it off. And so one of the members had an idea. Why don't we invite Charles Spurgeon, the legendary preacher, to come to our church and everybody who hasn't been to church in a long time, they'll show up because Spurgeon's there and then the whole community will show up and we'll take one big offering, we'll pay off our debt. Excellent idea. So he writes a letter to Charles Spurgeon, the famous preacher, and he says, we want you to come to our church to help us pay off our debt. And while you're in town, we want you to be comfortable so you can stay at one of my three homes. You can stay at my country home, or my city home, or my seaside home, whichever one works for you. So Charles Spurgeon wrote back to this member of this congregation, and he said, I have to decline your offer. You are a member of the family of God. 
sell one of your homes and pay your debt yourself. Sincerely, Charles Spurgeon. (laughs) It's not on others. It's on us. So we start today. Why is it so hard for us to give in a way that changes the way that we live? Wrestle with that. There are three types of givers in this world. There are rocks, and there are sponges, and there are honeycombs. Which one are you? A rock is the kind of person who will give, but they got to be smashed. (laughs) And even when they give, it's just a brief spark. A sponge will give, and they might give a lot, but you got to put your hands on them and wring them out tight. (laughs) A honeycomb will give, and you don't have to do a thing. It just pours out of them. You ever pulled out a honeycomb and it just flows everywhere and gets all over everything? Anyone who comes in contact with it leaves with a little bit of it on them? That's who you are, baptized follower of Jesus. God has poured every ounce of his grace and his mercy and his love into you and then some. You are overflowing with the blessings and the love and the goodness of God. Let that blessing and that love and those good things flow through you into your church and into your friends' lives and your family's lives, into everybody who encounters you so that everyone who meets you might leave with something on them from you. That's who you are. You pour forth generosity. May no one have to strike you in order to be generous. May no one have to wring you out in order to be generous. May it flow through you as freely as it has has flowed to you. Let us give. Not what we want, but all that we can. Because we are well aware of all that we have. In Jesus' name.